OK, proof of stake. So I'll start off for this uh, discussion by talking a bit more about and kind of clarifying the role that proof of work has in um, existing uh, blockchain consensus systems, because there are a lot of misconceptions about this. So one key point is that Bitcoin, Ethereum, and similar systems are open permissionless networks. And they are networks where anyone can participate and where the entire network is just made up of just random people who are from anywhere in the world who are participating. And there are no kind of privileged actors. There are no participants with any kind of identities. There are, uh, but basically, everyone is either anonymous or if they're not anonymous, then the system, ha the system itself has no way of telling who is and who isn't. So it's this kind of, it's this kind of environment which in some way, like, it is different from a lot of more traditional security settings, right? So it's like in traditional security settings, you know, you might, you're like, you might say things like um, you, you have 10 people that are running the system, and as long as six of them are honest, then the system works. And you can see how that might make sense if those 10 people are major banks or, you know, like governments or just like very trustworthy individuals. So, but if these ten people are just random anonymous people, then you have kind of you have different kinds of considerations that you have to deal with. And proof of work is part of the kind of solution that deals with that problem specifically. So the system in a blockchain has to agree on some kind of canonical order of transactions. It has to agree on, you know, this happened first, then this happened, then this happened, then this happened. And you can think of the agreement as being some kind of voting. Like there's obviously a lot of like very fine nuances and complexities in Byzantine fault tolerance research. I'll go into a few of them later. For now, think of it as being voting. People vote on what the order of transactions is. But if you have voting, then you need to have some way of counting who's eligible to vote. And so the problem you have is uh, something called a civil attack. So a civil attack is, is uh, fairly simple. Basically, you could imagine a system where you have some number of participants, and then here you have a bad guy coming in. Now, the bad guy wants to take over the system. The bad guy wants to take over the voting process, and he wants to be able to just basically shift the votes arbitrarily, do whatever he wants, reverse transactions, do all sorts of nasty stuff. So what the bad guy is going to do is, on his computer, he is going to spin up a huge number of virtual machines, and with each virtual machine, he is going to connect to the network separately, and he's going to pretend that each and every one of these virtual machines are an independent computer. And so now, even though the attacker is one guy, he's got 12 fake identities. The good guys have four identities. And so it looks like the attacker has 75% of the entire system. And the attacker can do all this with just one computer. Does everyone understand why symbol attacks are bad? Cool. OK. The role of proof of work is that it is an economic defense against symbol attacks. So the idea basically is that, per, that in order to have one unit of participation in voting, you have to prove ownership of some number of dollars worth of computer hardware. And the way that you prove ownership of computer hardware, and you need to prove ongoing ownership of computer hardware, so, it's not, so it, you can't just like keep on trading your computer around. And the way that you prove ongoing ownership of computer hardware is basically by running computations on it 24-7 that fully exhaust that computer's computational capacity. This is the only way to prove ongoing ownership of a computer, right? So basically, you prove ownership of a computer by running computations on it and uploading the results to the network. Now, how do we make this verifiable? Basically, it has to be some computation which is hard to perform and easy to verify. So in Bitcoin, the general the idea here is that people, like, there are a bunch of nodes in the network, and these nodes are miners, and they try to create blocks. And in order for a block to be valid, the hash of the block has to start with a bunch of zeros. Right? Now, in order to find the block whose hash starts with a bunch of zeros, you just have to keep trying random blocks over and over again until eventually you find a solution that's good. And then when you find a solution, you can broadcast it. And this way, basically, you're kind of prob basically the, the, your probability of creating a block is going to be, in the long run, proportional to the uh, number the amount of computing power that you have. If someone has three times more computing power, then they are going to make blocks three times, uh, three times more often than you. And this basically is how voting works in Bitcoin. Right? So basically, every time, every computer, 
or in the network which is mining keeps on solving these math puzzles. And the purpose of these math puzzles is basically to show that they actually are an independent unit of economic resource. And so if in order for an attacker to get 51% in this, voting, in this voting, voting game, the attacker actually has to have more economic resources put into mining than every other actor in the mining ecosystem put together. So this is supposed to create a fairly, a fairly high security model. Now, proof of stake. In, basically, the idea with proof of stake is instead of using computation as the limiting economic resource, you use digital assets inside the system. So instead of saying $1,000 of computing hardware, one vote, it's $1,000 of Bitcoin, one vote, or $1,000 of Ether, one vote. And the reason why this is interesting is because proving ownership of digital assets is easy. All you do is you just make a digital signature. The blockchain itself already keeps track of how many, of how many units of Ether everyone has. And so all you need to do is just make a signature and prove that you, as the person who has that particular account, are voting for some particular block. So the goal of proof of stake is, well, there's two goals. One of them is that I believe proof of stake can actually substantially increase security. But the second one is that proof of stake can basically dramatically reduce the energy consumption and dramatically reduce the economic cost of a public blockchain consensus. Because instead of proving like this, doing this incredibly inefficient kind of trick of proving ownership of computers outside the system by running them 24/7, you're proving ownership of assets inside the system by making a digital signature. There's two major flavors of proof of stake. So the first major flavor of proof of stake is something called chain-based proof of stake, and this is the older kind of flavor of proof of stake that has existed since around 2011. And it attempts to very closely replicate proof of work. Right, so in proof of work, you have a, you have each a blockchain, and you have people constantly trying to create blocks, and the blocks form a chain, and each miner's probability of being able to create a block during any particular point, during any particular interval of time, is proportional to the amount of computing power that that particular miner has. You have twice as much computer, computing power, that means that you can, bur you, you can run through different hashes uh, twice as quickly, and so it's twice as likely that you get lucky and you, and you find a valid block. In proof of stake, basically chain-based POS tries to do the same thing. It tries to closely replicate proof of work by just explicitly giving every coin holder some chance per second of being assigned the right to create a block. So I have one coin. Every second, I have a chance of one in a million of being able to create a block. You have three coins. Every block or every second, you have a chance of three in a million of being able to create a block. Someone has 20 coins. Every second, they have a 20 in a million chance of being able to create a block. So <clears throat> this is I mean, the main reason why this was attractive is basically because, number one, it's simple. Number two, it works like proof of work, and so it feels kind of intuitive and attractive, right? Now, as we're going to find out, there actually are probably two major pitfalls to this kind of uh, uh, chain-based proof of stake algorithms, at least naive ones. So the first one is um, RNG, random number manipulation. So in proof of work, you, you, have this, uh, you, you have this mechanism where any miner has some chance per second of being able to create a, a valid block, but there's no way to predict ahead of time who it's going to be. Right? Every miner actually really does, from the point of view of their private knowledge, have some particular chance, some probability per second of creating a block, and you can't predict ahead of time you know, who's going to get lucky or when. Because if you could, then that means that you, you already know how to create a block. So, uh, this actually is a kind of fairly important security property for because it basically means that there isn't like it, re it removes a large category of possible ways of kind of manipulating the blockchain in order to try to get your way. In proof of stake, you do not have this kind of external source of randomness or this external source of implied randomness that comes from the uh, the fact that people don't know what the results of hashes are going to be ahead of time. 
So instead, mm -hmm. you have to rely on randomness, which is inside the system. So if you have a proof of stake chain, and the, the way the proof of stake chain chooses who gets to create blocks is by relying on randomness inside the system, can the RNG be manipulated? Mm -hmm. The problem is the random number generator has to be a deterministic function. So it's a pseudo random number generator. The pseudo random number generator is based on some seed data. When you make a block, you're contributing to that seed data. And so the question is, can you tr basically can people making blocks try to manipulate the system by creating blocks that have different data, right? So if, for example, you have a system where the, pseudo the source of the pseudo-random number generator is a block hash, then you could imagine some block maker at proof of stake seeing that they got assigned the right to create a block, making 10,000 different blocks, then finding the one out of those 10,000 that maximizes their near-term future revenue, and then publishing that block. So basically, they just manipulate the randomness in order, to ma in order to get their way in the future. Now, the main reason why this is bad is basically because it's a centralization risk, right? So basically, if you have a lot of stake, then you're going to have a much more, you're going to have many opportunities to manipulate the randomness, and so you're going to have many opportunities to improve your chances of winning even further, and you could even potentially get to the point where you're, produ you're producing almost all of the blocks. So there are, I mean, people have from there gone on to come up with various different algorithms that try to mitigate this issue. So basically the main challenge is, right, that we're trying to make a function that for some block determines the seed of the block. And the seed of the block is supposed to determine, no, it's supposed to be the source of this, these, kind of, these pseudo-random numbers that determine who is supposed to be able to create that block. So here is the approximate function in, in, in XT. The seed of the genesis is zero. The seed of a block is uh, calculated by hashing together the seed of the parent and the proposer of the parent. So the identity of the address that creates the parent. So the idea here is that if you get assigned the ability to create a block, the only thing that you can do to manipulate it is you can either create the block or you can not create the block. Now, if you don't create the block, then that still is one bit of manipulation, but it's costly manipulation because you're denying yourself a block reward. Now, I actually did, the, I actually did some mathematical analysis of this, and it turns out that in some situations, doing the manipulation actually is profitable, but it's still only a medium-sized profit. It's not like an absolutely terrible thing that will immediately break the entire system. Well, like it's still bad. Um, there is another thing. Of there is another kind of uh, kind of grind um, attack here, by the way, where uh, um, basically people try to move their try to move their coins around in order to put themselves in a more favorable position. But in NXT has already fixed that problem, and the way they fix it is basically they require you to lock your address for at least one day before you can become a participant in proof of stake. So. There's, this is one mechanism. Then there's another mechanism that's, uh, that, I call, that I call Randau, it doesn't, but it's really based on, well, it's based on something else which is called Randau. It doesn't really have a good name of its own. But the idea basically is that instead of putting the, the, proposal, the proposer of the parents here, you would put a value. This is a value which is kind of a commit reveal value. So when you make the block, you reveal a value, but this value has to be the hash pre-image of something that you've already committed to. So the idea here is that it still preserves the property that you, that you have only one bit of manipulation and it's costume manipulation, but because the data that determines future block makers is hidden, you have much less visibility into the consequences of your manipulation. You have much less visibility into just the looking, you know, what's gonna happen in the future if I make the block versus what's gonna happen in the future if I don't make the block and this makes manipulation harder. There's also another approach that was created by Ido Bentov that has to, that's, uh, Called, has to do with low influence functions. The idea with low influence functions is basically that the, um, the pseudo random numbers get created from a range of 10,000 blocks, and then you would take the majority rule of the 10,000 blocks. So if basically each block contain, contributes a bit, if the one bits add up to more than 5,000, you take that value. If they add up to less than 5,000, you, you take the other value. And the main reason why you want to do this is basically because this actually is about 100 times more expensive to manipulate. So 
this is kind of an area of research, and there are different ways to do this. But in general, this, uh, this probably is one of the major challenges of uh, chain-based proof of stake, but it is solvable. The second problem, and possibly a more serious problem, is uh, something called the nothing at stake flaw. So the idea here is uh, this. In proof of work, when you're a miner, if there are two blocks that you have to choose from, then you only have one unit of computing power, right? And the computing power is a, is a, some, a resource which is outside the system. And so if you have a unit of, uh, this unit of a resource outside the system, then you only, have, you only have, you have to choose, right? You have to choose either to put it on, uh, uh, to kind of mine on top of chain one or mine on top of chain two, or you can split 50-50, but that's a linear combination. So if you split 50-50, then you know, you're mining half as strong on one side and half as strong as on the other side. And so your incentive is to mine on the chain that you think is most likely to win. In proof of stake, though, the problem is that because it's using a resource inside the system, you can, what you can do is you can vote on both. So on chain A, you can try using resources that are on chain A, and on chain B, you can use the resources that are on chain B. So the fact that, the, that you're using resources inside the system itself means that in this kind of event of a fork, you have this ability to just, and the incentive to just create blocks on top of as many different chains or forks as possible. So this is a, I mean, this is not a flaw in an honest majority model because honest validators are, are not supposed to double vote, but it is a flaw in any kind of economic incentive model because it basically means that even in the absence of a malicious attacker, everyone has the incentive to just vote on every chain. And so basically you could imagine just never coming to consensus on anything at all. Now, the, the simple solution to this is some form of penalty-based proof of stake. So the idea base here basically is that we just explicitly detect uh, double voting and we explicitly penalize double voting. If you get caught voting on side A or on and side B at the same time, then you lose a lot of money. And this is how we kind of just explicitly plug the hole, right? We just explicitly say, if you do both, you lose money, and therefore your only real choices are to do this or to do this, and so you're going to vote on the chain that you think is most likely to win, and this gets you the convergence property. So this is kind of intuitively the simple kind of kernel of how to solve nothing at stake. But it turns out that if we want to, we can actually go further, right? So there is another major school of proof of stake, and this is actually the school that Ethereum is, uh, research is currently kind of looking to use for its next uh, major version. And this is deposit and penalty-based and uh, traditional BFT-based proof of stake. So the idea here is that, first of all, you have some notion of a validator set. And you can think of the validator set as just being the set of people who are currently participating in the consensus. Anyone can join as a validator by submitting a deposit. So you submit some ether into, into a smart contract, and then after some period of time, you get inducted and you become a validator. Um, validators are penalized basically for contradicting themselves. So you can we'll talk about this in more detail later, but for now you can think about this kind of abstraction. Now, Casper is heavily based on various ideas from traditional BFT theory. So how many people have heard of either Lamport's Byzantine Generals problem or DLS or PBFT or any of those? Okay, so a lot but not all. But basically, even before Bitcoin, there was this kind of 35 year long, uh, well, before Bitcoin, 25 year long tradition of research into um, distributed kind of Byzantine or fault tolerant algorithms in distributed systems contexts that originally were intended for use in kind of in a different environment, right? So originally they were meant for use in more permission environments where you have 10 operators and you want your system to survive, and these 10 operators are all semi trusted, and you want your system to survive and continue working if the majority of these are all honest, right? So you want to be able to tolerate at least some faults but you're willing to rely on this kind of honest majority assumption because these are all participants that you know, and so 
you know, you can, you, you can trust the fact that most of them are going to do what they say they do. So there is some, a bunch of research. So there is by like Lamport. Um, there is an algorithm called, B, called PBFT, Practical Byzantine Fault Tolerance, that gets used by a lot of people. Um, in general, the basic, I, these algorithms, so technically, chain-based proof of stake is a Byzantine fault tolerant consensus algorithm, but these more tra uh, traditional BFT algorithms tends to have stronger properties than the chain-based algorithms have. And the stronger property that they usually have is basically they rely much less on um, assumptions to do with network latency. So the idea here is that if you look at chain-based algorithms, one of the other, and like this includes proof of work or proof of stake, one of the flaws that they often have, or, or that they always have, is that if network latency gets really high, then basically the chain stops being like a chain, right? You have a lot of different forks. You might imagine someone produces one block, then on top of that one block, three blocks get produced. So there's a lot of inefficiency. And then an attacker can just come along, and an attacker is running on one computer, and so the attacker can make a perfect chain. And so the amount of, uh, well, the portion of hash power, the portion of stake needed to basically outrun everyone else goes down from being 51% to potentially arbitrarily low, or potentially approaching 0% if network latency is extremely high. These algorithms have um, a, uh, something that's called a safety under async, which basically means that they satisfy certain safety properties regardless of how long network latency is. So even if the network messages are completely unreliable and they sometimes take a second to arrive, they sometimes take a minute, they sometimes take an hour, there is still a guarantee that these algorithms are not going to fail in certain ways. And even that these the, if network latency ever eventually becomes normal again, then these algorithms are guaranteed to, uh, uh, to, uh, to continue making progress. So this, this is the sort of, the, the main reason why you'd want to be interested in, 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 there's actually two reasons why I want to be interested in the, these algorithms. One of them is that it turns out that the safety proofs for these kinds of algorithms would tend to carry over much better into an economic context, and we'll talk about why later. And the other thing is that um, with, uh, these, with these kinds of algorithms, basically because these algorithms have these stronger safety properties, you don't need to worry about the wor uh, so much about the worst case anymore, right? So you, if you really wanted to, you could even make an algorithm, a blockchain that regularly finalizes blocks every four seconds, but then you know that if the block time ever, or if the network latency goes up to four minutes, then everything else will still be fine. It's just that the block time will, the blockchain will slow down. So the here, so here are the two, here are the kind of security claims that Casper tries to go after. And I mean, Casper is not. An, is a not the first BFT-inspired proof-of-stake algorithm, but it is the probably, I mean, probably the, the, the first algorithm that tries to kind of really go after both of these properties and have this kind of formal idea of what both of them are. And so the two properties are simple. So the algorithm defines a notion of finality. Now, finality is something that proof-of-work does not have, and chain-based proof-of-stake does not have. Finality basically means a block is set in stone, and we can never go back. If this block is finalized, it is in history, and it is in history forever. You cannot disagree with it anymore. So notice that in proof of work, we never have finality because someone can always make a longer chain. Now, we do have kind of de facto finality because of things like checkpoints, but like that's, but like in the protocol, we don't really reach that within any reasonable period of time, right? So within this notion of finality, we then have these two security claims. The first security claim is accountable safety. You notice that accountable safety is simultaneously a claim in an honest majority model and a claim in an economic model. So the claim in the honest majority model basically says if two thirds of the validators are honest, then the, everything works, everything will be fine, and you're not going to have situations where two conflicting blocks get finalized. The economic claim is even stronger. So remember, Casper is a deposit and penalty-based proof of stake. In order to join the, and, and the Casper proof of stake and become a validator, you have to deposit some ether. 
And if you deposit Ether, then if you get caught doing something bad, then your entire Ether get, can get taken away from you. The accountable safety claim basically says, if two conflicting blocks get finalized, so by conflicting we mean something like this, right? Like, does everyone understand why it's very bad if like these two blocks get finalized at the same time? Okay. So these, two, these three blocks are not conflicting with each other because they're part of the same chain. These two blocks are conflicting because they're part of different chains, and you're not supposed to be able to finalize two chains that, conf that conflict with each other. So if two conflicting blocks get finalized, then at least one third of validators have to have broken the rules, and if they break the rules, they get caught, and they lose their entire trust. So this is the kind of very strong claim. Then the second claim is plausible liveness. And plausible liveness basically says, if two thirds of the validators are honest, then it's always possible to finalize more blocks. So this just says you can always keep finalizing more things. So stage one for Ethereum is actually a hybrid design. And the hybrid design basically is that you have a proof of work chain at the bottom. And then on top of the proof of work chain, you have this, what we call kind of a finality gadget, which is basically these validators. And these validators basically send these two different kinds of messages. And by sending these kind of messages, they can finalize points, right? So you have a proof of work chain. The proof of work chain grows. And then for, any, for every 100th block, after some period of time, eventually it gets finalized. And once it gets finalized, then you can't go back anymore. So there are two kinds of messages that are called prepare and commit. These are kind of terms from, from like traditional Byzantine fault tolerant algorithms. But basically, the idea is you have these blocks, and every 100th block is a checkpoint. In this case, we're using three instead of 100 because you can't really show 100 things on a slide. Um, so you have these, these uh, checkpoints, and then after a checkpoint, everyone sends these prepare messages, and then after you have prepare messages, everyone sends commit messages. And if, in the normal case, after these commit messages, uh, this block gets finalized. Now, in, there are going to be cases where during one particular, one particular epoch, so one, you might have a checkpoint that doesn't get finalized because just it, this thing doesn't get enough messages, this one doesn't get enough messages, but then its, it's descendant could get finalized in the future. Um, so we can define kind of justification and finality here recursively. So we basically say there's these two, con there's two kinds of messages. One kind of message is a prepare, the other kind of message is a commit. And the rules, be, and we, we define these kind of words in this way, right? So we say, first of all, the genesis is justified and the genesis is finalized. So the genesis is just like the first block in the, in the entire blockchain. It's the block that everyone agrees on as, as part of the protocol rules. Then we have a rule that says, if two thirds of the validators prepare some checkpoint, and this checkpoint, and every prepare message has to specify both a checkpoint and a source checkpoint. If two thirds of the validators prepare some checkpoint, and they claim some already justified checkpoint as a source, then this checkpoint C also becomes justified. If C is justified and two thirds of the validators commit, then C is finalized. So in this particular case, if we assume like these prepares all, are all prepares based off of some previous hash that was already justified, then this uh, checkpoint, after these prepares, this checkpoint becomes justified, and after these commits, this checkpoint becomes finalized. Right? So, then the protocol defines, a set, defines two slashing conditions. And slashing conditions are basically rules that say these are things that validators are never supposed to do. If you do these things, then these things are kind of like the equivalent of voting for different things at the same time. If you vote for two different things at the same time, then this is bad, right? And you are a validator that's being malicious, there is evidence of this, and your entire deposit can get taken away. So, in general, right, like slashing, basically the slashing conditions that we have are for sending two messages that contradict each other. So, and if a violator violates a slashing condition, their deposit gets deleted. So a slashing condition might look like this. So it might say, if you send two prepare messages for two different things within the same epoch, so, that, so basically, if you make a prepare for this checkpoint and make a prepare for this checkpoint, then this means that you violated a slashing condition and your deposit, your entire deposit can get penalized and you can get, and it can get deleted. 
Um, this is how it's actually implemented in code. So in uh, Casper, there's basically two slashing conditions. So the first one basically is no double prepare. So you cannot prepare two conflicting things in one epoch. So this is kind of like very obviously saying you can't vote for two contradictory things at the same time. And there's a second one which is um, commit prepare consistency. And commit prepare consistency basically says if you prepare in one epoch and you specify some source, but then you can't commit anywhere in the middle. So the idea is that when you prepare, you're supposed to be saying, this is the last justified thing that I've heard of. But then, but then if you commit, commit on something in the middle, then there's clearly some justified thing in the middle that you know about. And so you're contradicting yourself. Right, so the idea is that there's, we basically specify these kind of two standardized ways in which validators can contradict themselves. And we actually have a mathematical proof that says if two in, any two conflicting checkpoints get finalized, then at least one third of validators need to have broken the rules. And if a validator broke the rules, then there's evidence that they broke the rules. Evidence that they broke the rules can get included into the blockchain. And if the evidence gets included into the blockchain, then they lose their entire deposits. So that's, I mean, like the details of the actual, the actual algorithm itself are kind of, uh, I mean, probably too complex to go to kind of fully go, uh, go through right now, but that's the basic idea, right? There's a bunch of rules that validators follow. If validators follow the rules collect, uh, correctly, then they can finalize new blocks. But if any two conflicting blocks can finalize, then that means that a lot of validators need to, needed to have broken, broken the rules. And if a lot of validators broke the rules, then that means they lose their entire deposits, which means that breaking the safety guarantee of the algorithm is extremely expensive. So this is just kind of one, the way that we are trying, the kind of security claim that we're trying to get out of this kind of BFT inspired uh, uh, proof of stake algorithm. So we actually even have formal proofs on this. So we have formal proofs that this works. We have formal proofs that it wor uh, we have a design that allows this to handle validator rotation. We have a formal proof that that works too. So this is, kind of the, direct, the, the direction that, we're, that um, uh, Casper is going. So as far as uh, kind of uh, way you know, longer, term uh, longer term challenges for this, um, I would say the main challenges are, first of all, continuing to improve kind of fine-grained incentives. So uh, very fine-grained incentives around how do we maximally encourage people to stay online? How do we maximally encourage people you know, not to go offline? How do we penalize various kinds of attacks? How do we centralization. Can we come up with a mechanism that combines together the benefits of a BFC-based proof of stake and chain-based proof of stake? Um, scalability, things to do with sharding, and just making the thing go faster. There you go. Thanks.